Now, Greg Kennisser is our speaker tonight. He's a lecturer at the Botanics with research interests in the leguminosae, especially the genus Latherus, the sweet pea family. He's all very, also very interested in the traditional uses of plants. His interest in plants and natural history arose at an early age because he lived next door to a derelict building site and he spent many happy hours hopping over the fence to go and see what was there. So he has a broad interest in natural history, but plants win out over all the other um, features of natural history. His talk tonight looks at the many ways that plants appear in uh, tra traditions of, mag of magic and religion. And there will, the, there will be some nod to uh, Christmas classics as we go. So now over to Greg now. Many thanks indeed, Julia, and I hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here in my home, strangely enough, and give you an insight into the kind of dysfunctional Christmas, dysfunctional botanical Christmas that um, I think really exemplifies the way that plants have drawn through into myth and into legend and into to magic with a, a little kind of loose nod here and there to uh, the kind of festive aspect of things. Now, the way I thought I would kind of uh, pull this this uh, presentation together was looking at kind of five kind of key elements of the festive season with a, a bit of a kind of a, a Christmas um, slant to it for things. And we will spend most of our time in Northern Europe, but we'll, we'll dot off to various other parts of the globe as well and pick up some of these kind of parallels that there are in the way that people have used plants in myth and, and, and uh, magic as well. So I thought we would first of all have a little look at choosing and decorating your tree. Then we'll have a, a bit of a Christmas dinner with a kind of plant based menu, of course, there'll be no, no animals on the on the menu there. Then we'll look at that classic of dealing with relationships at Christmas time and family feuds and some of the ways that plants have been able to, to help people with that, supposedly. Finally, well, not finally, sorry, but, but all importantly, we'll look at coping with the excess of the season. And that's something um, certainly I know I'm going to suffer from over the next week or two, I'm sure. And the last thing, of course, is, is looking at what the new year will bring. So what's going to be our future and how plants have been used to help define the future. Um, as we go through, though, however, you'll find that um, if I'm talking about a particular plant, I'll undoubtedly touch on other aspects of these five areas um, because plants are so versatile when they pop up in myths. And, and that's another thing we'll look at is what makes a plant particularly um, sort of significant in myth and magic and religion where some plants are and some plants really aren't they're very much mundane so we'll start off with i guess one of the kind of centerpieces for the kind of christmas festivities choosing and decorating your tree and broadly speaking of course that means we're looking at lots of conifers but i thought i'd start off with the two classic woody plants that we have um, for some of the carols so we'll, we'll start off with ilex aquifolium of course the holly and it's a really intriguing plant. It's one where, um, as you can probably imagine, nailed above a door, it was used to protect against evil spirits. And I guess one of the kind of key elements there is the spines. That's often what's cited as the thing that will chase away evil spirits. And that's something that, that's quite intriguing because if you look at um, Setsubun, which is a, a Japanese um, festival that happens kind of early February time, there's an Osmanthus, so in a completely different family, but similarly kind of spiny leaved Osmanthus um, that's used to make these things called Hiragi Iwashi, which are really interesting, uh, sort of like a wreath, but just a sort of single stemmed wreath with sardine heads stuck onto the end of the twigs and that's used to be able to drive off evil spirits um, for the past year. And again, the kind of idea there is that you have these spines on the kind of spinal leaves of the, the Osmanthus, Osmanthus heterophyllus it is, and those drive away the evil spirits. So in completely opposite ends of the globe, you've got people using um, unrelated plants, but with that similar kind of feature which uh, draws them together for that same use for driving away evil spirits. So the, the reason we often incorporate holly 
into wreaths is partly because it's evergreen, partly because it's very cheerful for the female plants with their bright red berries, but also because of this kind of older tradition of being able to spike and chase away the spirits. Now, it's quite intriguing when you look at the way that people thought about holly in the past. Um, there were these concepts, just even in, in kind of mid and later Victorian times in rural areas of she holly and he holly. So she holly was actually spineless holly leaves and he holly were the ones that had spines on them. And it didn't actually have anything to do with the two sexes that there are in this dioecious plant. It's quite, quite an intriguing one to see. So here with this Ilex aquifolium Hansworth new silver, this cultivar, you can see we've mostly got what we'd call she holly leaves because they don't have spines on them. Um, so those ones that you typically find uh, sort of higher up in the canopy of the holly, whereas those more spinos ones that are lower down and more, more likely to be um, grazed or browsed um, are the, those he holly ones. And there is a really nice tradition of if you take these she holly spineless leaves and you put them into a hanky and tie it up with nine knots, this was a kind of an, an English tradition, you could put that under your pillow and it would invoke these kind of prophetic dreams. So quite an intriguing one. And there's a whole host of different plants where similar little kind of local divinations uh, pop up. And, and in many, many cases, it's difficult to trace where they came from and where that kind of concept came from. So yeah, an intriguing one for our holly. And then we'll have a look at our next one, of course, which has to be ivy. And it's quite interesting because in spite of it being ubiquitous, really striking, um, I, and well, perhaps not so useful. It doesn't actually have that many stories associated with it. In in some parts of Germany, it was one of several kind of similar climbing plants that were thought to be used um, by witches who would bind them into hoops and use them to escape pursuit. And occasionally, it's also one of the kind of plants that was bound into hoops to help protect against evil spirits in in Scotland, for example. But we'll have a look at some more of these as we go further through. Um, but it's kind of pliability um, and it, again, it's cheerful blackberries and it's evergreen aspect as well as that recognisable um, kind of really striking leaf shape mean that it's been incorporated into our uh, Christmas wreaths as well. So that's our holly and our ivy and we'll shift on and have a look at our first uh, conifer. So this might be an option if you're wanting to, to have a, a Christmas tree if you've not yet got one at all. Um, but not that common a one that we'll find. So this is Pinus sylvestris, Scots pine, so uh, our kind of uh, largest native uh, conifer in uh, Britain. And it, it has kind of quite interesting ties in Norway and Sweden in particular as the tree that's associated with a particular spirit called the Huldra. So if you bring Scots pine into your um, house and you find um, an alluring woman with a fox's tail and a huge big cavity in, in her back, um, that looks like it's kind of covered over in, in that distinctive orange pine bark, then you might have just invited one of these forest spirits into your house. It's a really kind of quite intriguing uh, concept, but apparently there's the Huldra, um, not particularly malign or, or dangerous in any way, but they um, are, were said to be really paranoid about people seeing their back with this strange kind of craggy bark and the fox's tail as well. So yeah, just beware, it's not, not necessarily the best one to choose. I would go for maybe a plastic tree, might be a little bit better. And I suppose that the, the idea with the Huldra is one of these things again that pops up in a host of different uh, societies. So when you look at um, the, this thing here, this is uh, the oak, uh, one of the, the kind of several oak species that you find throughout Europe. Quercus rober is one of them that was associated with the dryads. And of course, uh, Dryas and dryad uh, that, that kind of is Greek for oak and essentially uh, that's that, that kind of close tie in that the dryads themselves were the spirits that dwelled within the oak. So the oak is a, a major plant of course and it's one we'll come back to again and again that kind of pops up in magical tradition. But if we go much further afield and, and head over to Bengal, there's um, one of many different kind of concepts throughout the world of having things like, for example, the banyan ficus bengalensis um, has the, so it's, it's a, a ficus that produces these kind of a descending um, stems and ends up with a single individual plant producing what effectively is a huge grove and it looks like a, a, a kind of a, a small forest in its own right. Quite kind of um, sinister in many cases, there's not much things that will grow underneath it because of the, the kind of the evergreen leaves will, will keep the light out. 
And because of that, that's given these kind of banyan groves quite often a, a quite sinister reputation. So there's a whole class of boot, uh, the kind of uh, sort of malevolent spirits that you can find in Bengal that are associated with banyan trees. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't really think that most people's front room would hold a full banyan tree uh, at all. But also some of the, the banyans have uh, much more benevolent ghosts who will help protect against the malevolent ones as well. Uh, so it's, yeah, it, it's, I suppose it's one way to get the ghosts of Christmas past, present and future into your house would be to, to bring in a banyan tree. Our next corner for them is another native. So this is Juniperus communis and a picture of it out there in the Pentland Hills and, and some of the kind of uh, mature female um, cones there. And it's quite an intriguing one because it's both blessed and cursed. And part of that probably comes through from the, the records that uh, the classical writers, so Pliny in particular in his natural history, wrote down a host of really quite interesting kind of quasi magical medicinal things. So he tried to draw in everything he could about uh, biodiversity, if you like, in his natural history. And those classical writings then went on and informed a whole host of, of what we see in Europe in terms of folklore and magic. And you can see the same kind of concepts coming through um, from uh, 2000 years ago. And it's quite uh, undoubtedly an important incense in classical times. So juniper was burned um, in order to keep away evil spirits in temples. Um, it was also supposed to have sheltered Jesus and his family when they, they flew from Israel and uh, they were being persecuted um, during the uh, uh, by Herod essentially. And um, in contrast to that then, in um, Italian medieval magic, it has a very, very bad reputation. And I suspect this is probably one of these things where um, the actual species is not always recorded because Juniper sabina, which is quite a toxic species, quite a kind of potentially dangerous species, might be one of these ones where it's got this kind of ill reputation. Or it might just readily be that it was considered a very kind of um, important magical kind of religious plant in classical times and used in Roman uh, state religious ceremony. And therefore it was probably quite a bad thing in the kind of the Christian context of medieval Italy. So it's, it's difficult to say. And a great many of these things, of course, are based on speculation. But that's part of the fun, to be honest. This one here um, is Capressus sempervirens, so uh, one of the Mediterranean cypresses. And unlike um, juniper, which has got this kind of dual nature, um, the, the cypress has a pretty bad reputation indeed. Um, one of the interpretations for this is perhaps because, I suppose like juniper um, and quite a lot of the others, uh, members of Cupressaceae, um, when you cut them, they won't grow back. So although they even, they, although they appear evergreen and have this kind of semblance of life um, constantly, they will suffer. So, so they're, they're kind of, if you, you, you cut off a branch, it won't uh, respond, it won't uh, grow back. So that's one interpretation of why um, it, it might have this association with the underworld. And it pops up in cemeteries uh, throughout the Mediterranean in many cases as well. It's also one of the woods that was alleged to be used to make the crucifix. But to be honest, if you looked at all the different woods that were supposed to have been used for the crucifix, you had to have a list of over a dozen different plants. There's a host of different plants. And it's really intriguing when you look at um, the plants through Northern Europe that you wouldn't necessarily find in the Holy Land. Um, a whole host of these have been accused, if you like, of being the, the uh, wood of the crucifix. So you th see things like um, Populus tremula, the aspen, uh, is been accused of it. And that's apparently the reason why it can never stand still. It's been cursed because its wood was used for the crucifix to be constantly chattering and trembling in fear of God. Alternatively, you could opt for alder, Ulnus glutinosa, um, and that's why apparently if you cut down an alder and look inside that red wood is the blood of its guilt for having been used to make the crucifix. And it's great. I love how the, these kind of stories and these ideas um, where people see a particular feature of a plant, they try and not necessarily rationalise it because there is a lot of storytelling in there, but they try and, and put these kind of, um, we could say rationalisations as to why the plants have these particular features. And of course, it's a rare thing in many cases for us to have a full account of such rationalizations. Um, and that's beautifully exemplified by this next conifer here, um, Taxus baccata. And there is just so much you could say about this plant. 
Um, it's got these beautiful red uh, berry-like cones, so it gives that kind of jolly look. It's an evergreen, um, it's native as well. Uh, so one of these things that you could, you know, quite readily have as a, a kind of a Christmas tree. It does do something that our Cupressaceae members and many of the kind of Pinaceae don't do in that it will come back. So it makes it, it's, it beautiful for our hedging. You can clip it back and it will uh, spring again and you'll get uh, new buds um, flushing quite readily. But I guess many people know this probably as a, a tree of graveyards and it has this very kind of strong association with graveyards and death, but not always as a kind of particularly bad thing. Um, and, and that's one of these things where people just heap speculation after speculation on it, which is really, really quite intriguing. Why do we find it mostly in churchyards? So different things have been suggested. It might be because it's toxic to livestock. So it's kept in churchyards where livestock aren't allowed in. Um, and of course, being that that um, wood that's used for making the very finest of bows, um, there was, it was a valuable resource and therefore growing it in the church where it wouldn't be eaten by livestock. And also there was a bit of kind of that sanctity where the, the trees couldn't be cut down willy nilly meant that they would be uh, protected to a degree. There's also the idea that they protect the dead. So being these evergreen things, they are and able to flush back they are symbols of life and renewal and hope for the future. Um, but also there's the concept that because of the, the toxicity of the plants, that they might be absorbing the malice of the ghosts, the spirits of the dead that are in the, the graveyards. And we have no clue which of these is true, if you like. They're all very much speculative, but that's part of the, the beauty of this. What is quite intriguing though is this toxicity is something that you see, which is um, a, a kind of connection that runs through its taxonomic name. So it's Taxus baccata, and some people suggest that that the derivation of Taxus um, uh, relates to its use as bows and for producing these kind of uh, bow staves um, because uh, Toxes is uh, a bow in Greek. And many of the kind of Greek epics that you come across, the kind of um, Homeric epics, for example, um, one to one combat between people and kind of uh, heroic combat was the real key thing. And bows were seen as quite cowardly because uh, archers would inevitably dip their um, arrows in poison. So it was a kind of a non heroic style thing. So very often they're edited out of these Greek myths in many cases. Um, and that toxes and toxic and taxis ultimately derive supposedly from that same route. But again, we've got to be a bit cautious with linguistics as well. So there's, there's plenty of argument and debate about that. Now, the bow was a really, really important weapon, uh, but a bit of airbrushed out of um, uh, history, essentially, uh, and out of mythology. Whereas this next conifer, which I don't think will fit in many people's houses, although there are some nice small cultivars that could work, um, was quite the opposite. So I love this thing here. So this is a cedar of Lebanon. And my interpretation of it is that it's the kind of nuclear weapon of the ancient Near East. And if you look at Assyrian steel, so this is this is an Assyrian steel here, you can see um, one of the these, these huge big monolithic uh, things that were stuck onto the side of walls so that when visiting dignitaries came to Assyrian cities, they would see these friezes that were showing and really demonstrating the power of the, the Assyrian kings. And this is showing here um, cedar logs and pine logs as well that have been harvested from the mountains and been brought down um, to, to use to build palaces. So they're being carried on the back of boats. And if you had control of the cedar forests, you were essentially in control of the ancient Near East. I mean, going right back to Sumerian times as well, the cedar forests were so important that the gods apparently um, put one of their most grotesque demonic kind of um, protectors, a kind of a weird creature called Huwawa or Humbaba, who was a giant who um, his face was kind of made all, of all kinds of contorted guts. Actually, I should probably have given a little kind of disclaimer. This is not appropriate for a family audience, this talk, but this hideous giant um, defended the uh, cedar of Lebanon forests from people coming to raid them. And although he looked hideous, and although he is he's described as having a, a voice that's like um, the, the kind of breath of a thousand um, fires and a really a terrifying sounding creature, he's actually really quite um, progressively um, uh, sort of 
ecologically friendly, to be quite honest, because he's looking at kind of protecting uh, this forest. Quite intriguing. Unfortunately, he comes to a, a bit of a sticky end when um, Gilgamesh and his companion go and, and slay him in that kind of classic heroic way. So yeah, the Cedar of Lebanon was incredibly important. But we'll go to another thing and our kind of next Assyrian plant, which is not a conifer. And we're not actually sure what it is. It's a really quite intriguing one. So this is one that pops up um, in Assyrian architecture as well. And you can see it there in the middle there. I'll just I'll make it a bit bigger there. And it's it's interpreted as the Assyrian tree of life. And there's a huge amount of debate goes back and forward about um, what this plant actually is. And I, I have to say, I mean, people suggest it's a palm or people suggest it is um, the cedar of Lebanon or various other things have all been proposed. Um, a, sort of a pomegranate, for example, pun Punica gratum, um, or uh, even a sort of very, very abstracted um, lotus as well. So these these things that were quite important throughout kind of a uh, Near Eastern and, and kind of Egyptian culture. But to be quite honest, looking at this, this is the kind of a fairly consistent interpretation of the Assyrian tree of life. It's not anything. I don't think it's pinned downable to one particular species at all, because if you look at the rest of the kind of carving that uh, there is in Assyrian architecture, it's exquisite, really quite wonderful. So you have things like this. So this is one of the Akpalu, these kind of guardian spirits that were supposed to um, support the, the Assyrian king. And it, it's got an incredibly exquisitely um, rendered face. It's beautifully three dimensional. The feathers, when you look at the feathers close up on these, these four wings, they are beautifully rendered, absolutely superb. And the detail there is exquisite. But compare that then with the kind of abstractness and the lack of detail on our Assyrian tree of life. And this would be um, stonemasons and carvers who were exposed to these plants that were supposedly the Assyrian tree of life, and yet they've done something abstract and much more kind of um, sort of magical looking, to be honest. So I don't think that is any actual particular plant we can pin down. What is very intriguing, however, is this thing that the Akpalu is carrying. So you very often see this. You'll see these kind of um, agents of the gods or the gods themselves um, holding what looks like um, a paint, paint pot or something like that. So in his left hand, you can see that. And in his right hand, he's got something that, again, people have debated over for some time. It looks somewhat like a pine cone, so pinus, um, but some people have interpreted it as a cedar cone or also as the slightly unopened um, male inflorescence of the date palm, Phoenix dactylifera. Um, and the idea there is that it might be covered over um, in something that's being used to pollinate the tree of life. So it's difficult to, to tell for these, but the concept is that um, the bucket holds the pollen of the tree of life and that this person's here being a horticulturist and, and making sure that the tree gets successfully pollinated. So a nice bit of kind of, um, I, I guess you'd say, sort of iconic and kind of um, just really demonstrating the power of these Assyrian kings, but through the power of pollination. So one interpretation has been that the pollen would spread throughout the land and bring uh, riches to the king and to his people. So yeah, really intriguing. It's wonderful. But I'm not quite sure uh, the kind of um, the uh, Christmas tree place down outside the church near, near where I live doesn't actually sell Assyrian trees of life. So we've gone for a plastic one instead. An alternative tree of life is, of course, the Norse one. So Fraxinus excelsior, the ash, is one of these things that is easy to identify, quite striking and very, very versatile. So it's had a whole host of myths and legends associated with them. And I think they're familiar to many people. So many folk will know that, that in Norse mythology, Yggdrasil is the, the kind of central tree that holds together and binds together the, the nine worlds in, in that mythology. Um, and it goes its roots deep down into the earth, into the kind of underworld and spreading up into the realm of the gods with uh, our plane of existence, if you like, stuck in the middle in Midgard. And of course, Odin, uh, the god of magic and kind of a uh, king of the gods, hung himself from uh, Yggdrasil, the ash tree, for nine days and nine nights or seven days and seven nights. And he sacrificed his eye in order to gain the power of runic magic. So yeah, a really quite magical plant indeed. So 
hugely important in Norse myth, but it's been brought right through into relatively recent times. So even in kind of late Victorian times and um, into kind of Edwardian times in Scotland, people would take an ash twig and they would uh, heat it up so that the sap bubbles out of it and it would be dripped into the mouth of uh, children and confer strength and vitality supposedly on the children. Um, intriguingly, um, its reputation spreads right throughout Europe in quite different ways as well. So Pliny's Natural History and a few other classical sources mention that snakes absolutely detest ash. And if you put down um, ash leaves supposedly around a snake um, and the only escape route is through a fire, then it, the snakes would rather go through fire than cross a line of ash, which is quite intriguing indeed. And uh, I know there's many medicinal kind of uses for, for plants and many kind of uh, uses of plants that have been demonstrated through kind of uh, phytochemistry that you can give a kind of a, a justification for this. But I don't think you'd get that research passed an ethics committee, I suspect. Um, and you wouldn't certainly get this one passed an ethics committee because there's some quite intriguing references in the late 1700s and early 1800s in England that talk about this concept of the shrew ash where you would take an ash tree and near a, a field where livestock live uh, and drill a hole in it and in order to protect the livestock from becoming ill you would take a shrew a little sorry a little uh, mouse like shrew and you'd jam it alive into the hole and then you'd seal the hole up and you would instantly have yourself a magical shrew ash and that ash tree growing near the livestock's field was apparently protecting the livestock against being bitten by venomous serpents or by shrews because shrews with their venomous bite were thought to confer a whole host of malaises and, and uh, dangerous conditions on the livestock. Last of all, those keys, the, the kind of uh, fruits that you find on female ashes uh, were a classic thing for driving away witches. And we'll have a look at a few others that, that did that kind of job as well. Um, and this is this is one. So I guess if, we, if we've got chosen our tree, I'm not sure quite which one you would go for, but we also have to then choose what our tree topper is, if you like, what we put on the top. And generally in this household, we would tend to put a star on top. So if we want to avoid any kind of fairies or angels coming in and making their way to the top of the tree when they're unwanted, you could chase them away with a broom or something. But the real one that, that was classically used in Scotland was this thing here. So Lycopodium clavatum uh, is a thing that, that developed this reputation that if you walked past it on a hill walk anywhere or you were making your way from town to town up over the hills where, where this thing grows, um, if you come past it, you could take a bit of the uh, plant and tuck it into your shoe. And that apparently would protect you from the effects of the fairy folk. And the effects of the fairy folk, of course, are that they would fire their arrows at you. And these invisible arrows would cause you all kinds of kind of uh, delays on your journey or make you ill or cause a whole host of different kind of problems. And the evidence for these invisible arrows is the only thing that's left are the arrowheads. And that's why apparently if you go up to the hills, you'll sometimes find a little stone arrowhead. And these are the, the fairy arrows. OK. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend collecting Lycopodium clavatum. I have to say though, it is possibly our only proven real magical plant, but only in show magic where you would have stage magic, because of course this thing, the um, the uh, spores are used as a kind of pyrotechnic effect and they'll, they'll disperse into the air and Heather McAfee uh, does an absolutely exquisite demonstration of this. I was planning maybe to do one, but I think I'd probably set the house on fire um, where yeah, you can disperse the spores in the air and touch a lighter to them and they give this beautiful stage effect explosion. It's never taken anyone's eyebrows off as far as I know. But yeah, that, that plant there apparently keeps away the fairy folk. And so does this. So this is a um, butter burr with an interesting kind of double reputation, like many of the plants we'll see. And um, it's one of the plants where if you took it up, you could take the roots of it. And I suspect the, the um, ped, uh, pedicel as well, the kind of flower stalk too. And you could make it into a little hoop. And these little hoops were tucked under milk pails or stuck on the lintel of a door in order to keep away the fairy folk and equally keep witches away because the fairy folk and the witches were typically thought of as interchangeable through, through much of Scotland, for example. Um, and it's quite an intriguing one. I've put some of the names that it has in English, in Scots and in Gaelic, and they tend to fall into these kind of two categories. So they'll either talk about the use of the plant for, um, they actually they don't reference it so much for protection, 
um, but they talk about the use of the plant more for its uh, ability to curdle milk. So it was used as a kind of curdling plant um, in order to curdle milk to make cheese and butter. Um, and the alternative in things like rock grass and sheep root that you see is because apparently if sheep grazed on this plant, then it would cause this really unpleasant disease in, in their hooves and their feet. Um, but because it grows in bogs, if you graze your sheep out on a bog anyway, then there's a very good chance they're going to get this um, foot rot anyway. And it's nothing whatsoever to do with the plant seemingly. But unfortunately, because people are looking for these associations between the plants and uh, an effect or the plants and some magical thing or plants and a disease, then this poor little plant ends up getting a bit of a bad reputation because of it. Intriguingly, we've only actually got one or two stories that, that suggest it's butterwort and it comes through this moan, this um, this Gallic name here. I wonder if you can see my, uh, my mouse pointer there. Um, and that may actually be a mistranslation. So it might be that it has no effect whatsoever and the thing's been mistranslated from Gallic and it's actually talking about a different plant that's used to make these little hoops. We are, however, completely certain about this as being a plant that's used to keep away witches and it's probably the one this this rowan here that we are most familiar with because a host of us have rowans in front of our um uh, gates in order to keep away witches and we'll kind of know that instinctively and and that's quite an intriguing one it's one of these relatively few traditions that still hangs around today but you can find um archaeological and historical remains of little crosses made of rowan wood tied together with red thread that were used to keep away witches. Um, you also find a really intriguing reference in um, the James VI work when he's talking about demonology. He, he speculates on whether or not, um, I can't remember if it, something like daft common wifey. So he uses that kind of a slightly, um, I thought not slightly, but immensely unmodern language for describing uh, rural uh, women using hoops of rowan and uh, bending them into hoops and then driving the livestock through and he's speculating on whether this kind of seemingly innocent um, use or traditional use uh, is magical enough and then kind of dodgy enough to be considered witchcraft or if it's actually mundane and there's this big debate about whether uh, these things that, that everybody was doing is is actually true witchcraft or not. Another thing is uh, this fungus here, the, the kind of probably a very familiar thing to many that grows on elder is um, wood ear or Jew's ear or Judas's ear or Achillea or Achillea judai. And it appears, we think, in a rhyme which goes black luggy, lammer bead puts the witches to their speed. And we think this is the black luggy that's referred to in that rhyme because it looks like a black lug, kind of an ear. Um, and a lammer bead is probably an amber bead. And apparently that combination uh, was able to, to drive off witches as well. But generally speaking, fungi, of course, have a more sinister reputation. Um, so you've got things like um, ergot clavicet purpurea that's down here on anthoxanthum, I think that is anthoxanthum odoratum, um, with these little black, um, the ergots themselves, the little sclerotia. Um, and because they contain a really quite interesting batch of uh, hallucinogenic chemicals. They've often been um, cited as being one of the reasons why there were uh, instances of uh, sort of mass hysteria through medieval times. If some of this got into grain and then was milled into flour, um, that, that's one of the kind of interpretations of that. Um, on the right, of course, we have fly agaric, and that's one where its reputation probably became quite stellar through the, the 50s to the 90s in particular, when a lot of the kind of counterculture looking at um, uh, anthropology around the world um, and that kind of tie in with hallucinogenic um, drugs uh, came in as well. And Amanita muscaria, of course, is used in uh, religious ceremonies by shaman throughout a lot of the parts of, uh, sort of northern Eurasia some of which involve um, passing through the kidneys and out through the urine and then kind of the, the celebrants drinking the urine or uh, drinking reindeer urine as well. Some really quite intriguing kind of uh, quite elaborate um, ways of using these in, in these kind of religious ceremonies. But in the 50s and onwards, it became one of the, the organisms that was identified as the possible soma or halma, which is a, a a plant seemingly that appears in the Rig Veda, so these really ancient kind of Vedic texts from uh, northern India. 
and the kind of it was tied in with a whole host of research that was done through the, the 60s and 70s and this for a long time was thought to be soma this so-called food of the gods and um, it's since been debunked as that but uh, people do also suggest that that red and white of course is where the uh, colors for father christmas's clothes come and then ultimately um, Coca-Cola with its secret recipe as well. Why is it red and white? You get all these comedy conspiracy theories popping up. Now the real Soma seems to be ephedra. Now this unfortunately is ephedra chilensis from Chile, but it will be of course one of these um, Iranian or Himalayan species that was used um, for Soma. Halma is its kind of alternative name and it pops up as a kind of an important kind of ritual component in Zoroastrianism as well. Um, but yeah, it's got some interesting compounds in there like ephedrine and pseudephedrine that will raise blood pressure and can kind of um, clear bronchioles as well. So that's used in, in modern medicine for um, uh, opening up uh, lungs, kind of, I mean, kind of combating kind of asthma to a degree. But on the flip side, it is also um, the thing that's used as a kind of forerunner, um, ephedrine and pseudephedrine, to um, production of crystal meth as well so it's got this kind of this multifaceted nature really quite an intriguing plant and this thing here is what we would put on our tree here at home this is delightful and i have to say when i was putting this photograph into the presentation the powerpoint here um it tries to suggest sort of alternative text for pictures and it said something like um fungus food delicious uh, dessert and I have to say I don't think that looks like dessert at all it must be some artificial intelligence recognition thing trying to interpret what it sees in these these photographs but this is nostalk and this blobby mass of stuff which is a kind of cyanobacterial colony is quite intriguing indeed this is our star okay and the star aspect of that is star snot because alchemists through the late 1600s well mid 1600s and earlier um write a bit about this particular weird kind of plant if you like it's kind of a, it's like a cyanobacterial colony to be honest um which seemingly appears out of nowhere and most commonly appears after lightning has struck supposedly and of course if lightning strikes it's probably associated with a whole host of rain it's a thunderstorm um, and what's happening is you have these dried colonies that you don't really notice and then when there's a huge amount of rain comes down they'll rehydrate start photosynthesizing in earnest and these strange blobs appear as if out of nowhere and this was harvested as an important kind of alchemical ingredient but the alchemists having no idea where it came from except from the, the firmament above thought it was the snot from stars which i love the idea of that so that's our star connected plant that we can stick up on the top of the tree so we'll move on to our christmas dinner and um as i said it'll be a, a vegan option that we have um and of course we have to have tatties to start off with so brought from the new world um but quite quickly found their way into a uh, folklore so one of the really nice little bits about it is if you're lifting heavy turkeys and sort of opening and closing oven doors and everything like that kind of thing you'll get a bit of joint pain you could get a bit of rheumatic kind of arthritic pain there and apparently if you take a potato and steal it from your neighbor's garden you can keep it in your pocket and it'll help to keep these pains away one of the key things there was it has to be stolen which i think is quite an intriguing one there's a few other traditions that pop up like that so roast tatties will help with your rheumatism and these things here will help with overindulgence in alcohol so people don't always like a brussels sprout but they are a wonderful thing and obviously a lot of the classical writers people like cato for example were particular fans of um the the cabbage as a whole and um, brussels sprouts is what we'll have for for dinner for things um but the whole concept for many of the members of the cabbage family is that they were at loggerheads with the vine because if you grew vines, you couldn't grow cabbages near them. And in part, that's interpreted as them both having a kind of high nitrogen requirement, which is quite kind of intriguing. Um, so because of that, because the two things didn't like each other, supposedly, you could use them to cure, cure a hangover. But even better than that, and it's something we'll look at a little bit more, um, is something that pops up in Robert Burns's poem, Halloween, where he talks a bit about some of the kind of rural um, 
traditions that people it's a sort of gently kind of satirical poem about the rural traditions and people getting um, very wound up and frightened by tiny little things like a, a, a rat or something on Halloween it's well worth a read um, but he alludes to a really quite interesting kind of Scottish tradition where apparently you would go out and collect cabbages and when you collected them uh, and or pulled the stalks up you would be able to work out what your future husband or future wife would be like um, and it's quite an intriguing one and there's a slight variant of that where you would have a stack of cabbages you would be blindfolded and you would go and uh, pick a cabbage out from amongst this pile and that would show you what the face of your lover would look like in the future which i have to say is quite worrying to be honest it's maybe um, not saying either it doesn't say much about uh, the scottish physiognomy or it suggests that cabbages were far more beautiful 200 years ago so our main course is going to be a festive pulse and nut loaf. Um, and we're looking at this. This is Pisum sativum, the P, which actually looks like it's about to become Lathyrus oleraceus. So genetic uh, work has told us that basically uh, Pisum probably has to be sunk into Lathyrus and Lathyrus sativus already exists as a name. So they've had to go back and look at a late 1700s name for the P. So it's probably going to become Lathyrus oleraceus, which is quite intriguing. Um, and it's a humble little thing, supposedly. But when you look into its folklore, it really isn't humble at all. Um, I would have this in any um, vegan nut loaf style thing quite readily because it's quite often associated with thunder and lightning for some reason. So it's considered a plant of Thor in many traditions or many kind of, uh, sort of Norse and, and allied traditions. And in Eastern Europe, um, it was associated with uh, these thunder dragons that would race through the clouds and wherever their lightning breath struck, peas would come up, which is really quite an intriguing one because it supposedly was associated with the smell, that kind of nitrogenous smell um, that, that peas produce. And we'll have a look at that in a second. But what's beautiful about that is this connection between peas and um, lightning is exquisite because they are, as legumes, nitrogen fixers and li lightning is the other big natural or not that big but it's a pretty significant nitrogen fixer as well so lightning strikes will um, break those bonds uh, in nitrogen and uh, create nitrous oxides essentially so it's one of the ways that you get this kind of biologically available nitrogen um, into the soil is through lightning strikes quite intriguing but of course peas do it so much better and beans as well. So this is um, Vistia faba, a pretty close relative of, of our pea, and it's one that's kind of uh, been interpreted as being the human bean. Um, so several scholars in classical times felt that the, the kind of the, the similarity of the shape between Vistia faba seed and either a kidney or testicles as well um, meant that it had a really close connection with humans um, and it was it was one of these things where people wouldn't eat Vicia faba because it was considered to be so human-like um, in, in its qualities. It's quite an intriguing one and again there's a funny kind of connection there unknown to them. If you look at the nodules where the, the little bacteria, the rhizobia are that do that nitrogen fixation, if you ever dig up a, a, a pulse and um, they'll have rhizobium leguminous arum in the little nodules on the roots and you can pop that open maybe with a fingernail and inside if it's red like this one here this is a Vicia cracker nodule and um, it means it's fixing nitrogen and in there the thing that's making it red is leg haemoglobin which is essentially the kind of oxygen carrier that makes an oxygen rich enough environment for these bacteria to survive and it's exquisite because these plants have developed in partnership if you like but, but essentially the, the uh, bacteria and plants have developed a form of haemoglobin so something that's very very closely similar almost identical in structure to mammalian haemoglobin so there is actually a funny kind of element of the idea that, that beans and peas are actually much more human than you'd like to think and I do love that concept where we talk about with um, chimpanzees for example we say they're 90 7.3 percent similar to humans or whatever but actually to be honest if you look at a whole load of the fundamental uh, processes that are going on in eukaryotes you could reasonably say that humans are about 30 or 7 percent the same as beans and i'll take that I'm, I'm very happy with that concept okay we've got a few more ingredients for our, our uh, nut loaf 
we've got uh, carrots, so shredded carrots in there. And they're an intriguing one. They kind of pop up quite a bit in folklore, but they're a good example of this kind of a uh, doctrine of signatures that we'll look at a little bit more in a second. And uh, were used for um, essentially uh, kind of aphrodisiacs in a way. And I think that's probably because of the sort of suggestive shape of a root. And it's quite intriguing because that's a, a kind of European tradition. But then if you look at Platycodon grandiflorum, which is quite a kind of common thing you'll find throughout the Korean Peninsula and in Japan as well, um, it's used for exactly the same purpose as in traditional Korean medicine as well. So, and our last thing for a nut loaf is hazel, of course. We need to have some nuts in there. And it has a host of different uses. Again, it's very easy to identify and therefore it's probably developed a host of different lore as well. So, for example, if you've got conjoined hazelnuts, which I think is uh, multiple seeds in the one um, actual uh, ovary, because uh, each uh, you, you, you'll typically have uh, two stigmas sticking up and you'll typically have between two and four ovules, but usually only one ever gets produced that kind of a central uh, seed. The central nut is the only one that will mature and they're apparently very lucky if you find a kind of true conjoined hazelnut. Uh, it's the classic weed that people would use for divining rods for, for finding um, water and on the kind of flip side of that hazel groves were thought to be kind of haunts of the dead so you would have these multi-stemmed coppiced hazels and a bit like our banyan that we heard of before and um, that would be a dangerous place to kind of go, uh, particularly picking hazelnuts on a Sunday. If you met a charming man in a, a hazel grove on a Sunday, then that was almost certainly the devil and you should be in church instead. OK, most importantly, though, I, they pop up in the Fenian cycle, the kind of the, the um, myths and legends of uh, Finn, one of the Irish heroes, and they are uh, plants of knowledge. So you had nine hazel trees growing around a pool and when the hazelnuts dropped in, they were eaten by the salmon that became the salmon of knowledge. And a druid came to harvest the salmon uh, and cook it and he got Finn to cook that, um, that salmon. Uh, and unfortunately, a bit of the juice dropped onto Finn's uh, thumb. So he licked his thumb and instantly he could hear the birds and understand their language. And he heard two birds gossiping and saying, Finn doesn't understand, the druid's going to eat that whole salmon and become incredibly knowledgeable um, and Finn's going to get nothing. But luckily Finn decided to eat the whole salmon and became this great huge hero. So yeah, really intriguing little different bits of stories at all different levels for this plant. Here's our fig. So um, in lots of places the fig is kind of lucky, in other places it is considered kind of cursed. Um, it's possibly the actual biblical tree of knowledge rather than the apple, but it is pretty typical that um, the, the apple in Northern Europe becomes the kind of tree of knowledge because it's a nice, large, edible fruit, easily identifiable and probably much more prevalent than you would find figs. Although this is a picture of a, a fig tree in Nottingham here. Um, a bit like our dryads the, uh, with oak and our huldra with uh, the, the Scots pine, figs were said to have a group of kind of spirits associated, associated with them who were kind of a group of kind of lustful satyrs called the, the Ducey. And then finally, um, Judas Iscariot was supposed to have hung himself from the tree. But again, like our um, trees that were used to, to make the crucifix, there's almost a dozen different species that Judas Iscariot was said to hang himself from. So we'll move on from that and look at our next aspect. And I think what we're hopefully OK for time will be maybe, maybe 10 minutes or so, I think. Um, but it's dealing with relationships and family feuds. And I know that can be a, a kind of significant thing at Christmas, and maybe perhaps less so this Christmas, I think, if we're, we're kind of um, uh, in, in our own houses in many cases. Um, and this one here is the classic thing for starting a relationship, of course. So this is the one that hung above uh, a door lintel will induce people to have a peck on the cheek and maybe a, a kiss that could lead on to you know, a long and, and healthy relationship after that. It is the icebreaker plant and a really quite intriguing one. Uh, it pops up in, of course, druidic lore, and it's one of these ones which is relatively rare because there's a whole host of speculation about the druids and, and their uh, rituals and everything, but we have a kind of quite reliable seeming contemporary account uh, in Pliny again, um, who suggests that oak is the best host for it, um, not the the best for it successfully being there but as far as the druids are concerned because it's quite a rare um thing to see mistletoe on an oak 
and the oaks were sacred to the Druids anyway, it was a particularly powerful plant, supposedly. So the ritual for harvesting it is that classic one with a golden sickle and caught in clean white robes, and you had to sacrifice two white bulls um, in order to do that. But then once you'd, sat, you'd managed to sat, um, harvest that mistletoe, you could uh, produce a drink that would cure all ills, particularly in livestock, but also in humans as well. And um, it might be a kind of a, a version of that that's come through to more recent times, this idea where if you had mistletoe berries infused in wine, honey and vinegar, they would promote prophetic dreams. But mistletoe berries, I wouldn't ever recommend even vaguely think about eating them. So, yeah, pretty toxic. A wand of mistletoe is one that if you carried that, you would suppose to be able to see spirits, uh, so-called spectre's wand in Germany. Um, and it had this kind of... Um, really quite interesting uh, reputation, probably this association between uh, the, the tree that it was growing on, which would shed all its leaves, and yet you would have this evergreen thing still growing on it with this really strong partnership between the mistletoe and the tree itself, the host species. So yeah, an intriguing kind of mix. And of course, it was mistletoe that was the, the one plant that was overlooked um, and didn't, pro didn't make that promise not to slay the Norse god Baldur. So Loki took a sprig of mistletoe and used the blind god Holder um, and um, managed to, to slay his foe uh, through trickery in classic Loki fashion. This year, if, if mistletoe and that small peck on the cheek is, is, is not really enough, then this is an interesting kind of a uh, love potion that was made in, in Scotland, kind of supposedly in, in Gaelic speaking parts of Scotland, which involved a brown seaweed. I don't think it specifies too much which, but it appears in Carmina Gadelica, um, Alexander Carmichael's book on kind of a uh, folklore and folk tales of Scotland. Um, you had a uh, foxglove, you had royal fern and butter burr, and you would take them to a big flat rock by the shore, you would burn them and you added one more ingredient, which gives it a bit of a kind of horrendously sinister twist. And that was apparently the bones of an old man, knuckle bones rather than the skulls that we've got here. But this thing here, you would never think from those, those uh, ingredients it was supposed to make a love potion. But you would take the ash and rub it on the chest of your lover and they'd be faithful you, to you forevermore. Okay, so yeah, an intriguing one, but uh, really quite unpleasant, I have to say. And this thing here is another one. So if, if you know you might be trying to promote relationships and love, and there's lots of things that will certainly do that. Um, but this here, although it's got a very villainous reputation, um, it actually isn't always bad. This is hemlock, so pretty poisonous and one of our most poisonous plants. Uh, but Culpepper, the herbalist, explains that it prevents lustful thoughts, which could be you know quite useful in, in kind of um, the uh, preventing any uh, faux pas or anything like that kind of thing. Pliny mentions it's really valuable in snake bites, and that might be because it's got this quite strange kind of fetid mousy smell to it. So people often associated uh, poisonous or smelly things as being useful for counteracting other poisons as well. So it does have some supposed magical benefits, but I have to say it uh, it's, it's kind of ill reputation outweighs its kind of good reputation, to be honest, and it, it pops up in witchcraft fiction a lot. So it, it's in there as one of the ingredients in Macbeth's witch's um, potion, and it, it comes up in this really nice little uh, stanza from The Witch of Fife by James Hogg, who says, We saddled our nags with the moon fern leaf and rode for Kilmerin Kirk. Some horses were of the broom cow framed in some of the green bay tree, but mine was made of an Enwolf shaw and a stout stallion was he. So that's that's James Hogg explaining the different uh, types of uh, steeds that the um, the witches rode on. So you've got a, a broom, you've got bay tree, and you've got hemlock as well. And all of them are using moon fern leaf uh, as their saddles. And to be honest, it's quite interesting because most of these types of references come from more recent um, literature and kind of more romantic literature than being contemporary with actual witch trials. And I think very often a lot of the kind of botanical aspects of witchcraft have been over interpreted and over romanticised. Um, so it's quite an intriguing one indeed. But you do find nice reference to this. And this is absolutely perfect. If, if all goes wrong and you get chucked out of the house um, and it's one of these really it's a tense Christmases, you know, then there's a host of different plants that can get you back into the house. Okay, 
So moon war is one of these. That's that moon fern leaf. Um, and it, in Britain and several other countries nearby is supposed to be what's called the woodpecker plant. And again, it's something that comes from Pliny. And he mentions that if you uh, set a fire underneath a woodpecker's uh, nest hole, but you stop up the hole before you set the fire, then the woodpecker flies back and it tries to get in the hole and it panics because it sees the fire coming up. So it'll fly off and it will go and collect some mysterious plant and then flies back and uses that to unlock the stopper and can, can rescue it, its chicks. And that's a really intriguing, quite elaborate story, but it's been taken up by peoples throughout Europe and the local plant that is the supposed uh, woodpecker plant uh, that allows you to unlock uh, any gate or uh, open up any door uh, pops up in different places right throughout Europe. So it's uh, Batrachium lunaria here in Britain. It's things like uh, I think Paris quadrifolia in Iceland, for example, and a, a batch of different plants throughout Europe do that job. The other one um, is Mandragora. So Mandragora officinarum, apparently the, the plant would be able to, if you had it, you could touch it to locks and it would open up any door and you could get in. And even better than that, Mandragora was supposed to give off this kind of uh, luminescence. So you could carry it through a house and it was supposed to be one of these plants that housebreakers might use because they could get into the house and they could use it as a torch to light their way. And it becomes mixed up in this funny kind of um, sort of um, just misidentification or something or a kind of corruption of the story uh, with this idea of the hand of glory. So this was another kind of tool used in relatively recent times. So through the kind of 16th to early 18th centuries. And this one here is a hand of glory in the museum in Whitby um, in uh, North Yorkshire. And supposedly if you dug up the hand of a criminal, um, it would be uh, usable. You could light the fingers and they would become like candles and you could use it, tap it against the door and it would open up the door. People think this is actually because um, there is an old tale of Mandragora having grown underneath where criminals were hanged. And because these things that people often interpret as looking human-like on the mandrake, um, they can also look like fingers. People thought that that actually was this idea of a hand that you could use to open up locks. And these two stories have kind of become intertwined. Either way, um, I know what I want for Christmas. It sounds a very useful tool, definitely. So not too long to go. We'll have a quick look at coping with the excesses of the season. Um, there's a host of different nice hangover cures out there, some of which are, are justified because Philopendula omaria um, it has that methyl salicylate in it. It's the kind of a, a, an oil of wintergreen kind of uh, the thing that gives it its really interesting, uh, pleasant smell, but is metabolised into salicylic acid. Um, and it also pops up in the Irish myth cycles as one of the ingredients uh, in a, a kind of a calmative, restorative uh, bath that's given to the hero Cúhulán. So when Cúhulán gets in his battle fury, there's this really graphic description of what happens to him. His bones twist round in his body and black stuff spouts out of his head and he, he lays waste to all his foes. But his body becomes so hot to touch that his allies have to make this cauldron with all these different plants in it um, in order to calm him down and cool him down. And one of them is Lus Cúhulán, the Philopendula the meadow sweet. So hangover cure would be very useful, something like that kind of thing. If things are worse and you really do overindulge, then you might need something like liverwort. So if your, your liver is looking very, very peaky, then uh, that's obviously one of these things where it's using the doctrine of signatures, this idea that, that liverwort is thought to look like a very diseased liver. And if your liver does look like that, then you need to definitely seek medical attention. But the idea was because it looks like a diseased liver, you could use it to cure that condition. And there's a host of other plants that are like that as well. So we have um, Liberia pulmonaria, the, the lichen lungwort, um, as well as pulmonaria, the, the angiosperm lungwort. And we've got adder's tongue. Adder's tongue used for curing snake bites, supposedly. And Liberia pulmonaria, which looks like very, very diseased lungs, was used for curing lung complaints. John's wort. Uh, it's quite an interesting one. So um, it has been shown to be very efficacious in uh, treating kind of psychiatric conditions like depression, for example. And that was often interpreted as um, the um, possession 
by spirits and kind of been taken over by demons, essentially. And quite an intriguing one because it will have had this this kind of uh, physiological effect successfully. Um, but it's reason that it's it, it's in here for uh, the doctrine of signatures idea is that if you take it and infuse it in water, um, it produces this uh, it, it, sorry, in oil. It will turn the oil red. I think possibly the hypericin in it will, will turn the oil red. And that was thought to be uh, good for blood conditions. So quite an intriguing one indeed. But the doctrine of signatures pops up everywhere in a whole host of different plants. And if if these kind of things don't don't work, it's just this kind of quasi magical medicines, then you need to rely on something more serious. And I can't recommend better than this, although you have to wait till early August for it. So this is the Burry Man um, from South Queensbury. And if you've not had a chance to go to the Ferry Fair and see the Burry Man parading around the town covered in the, the, the fruits of burdock, um, it's an absolutely wonderful sight to see. It's got a slight feel of the wicker man about it. It's kind of ritualistic and, and just superb. But um, the body man gets decked out in a linen costume, covered over with burrs, and then parades around the town getting a small nip of whiskey at every significant stop he makes. And he sets off quite early in the morning, and by four o'clock when he comes back into town, you can see him and his helpers there really need to hold him upright as well as they can. So it's, it's quite a challenge. But the idea for this is that apparently he's taking the um, sins of the town away. That's one of the kind of interpretations. And the burrs represent the sins and the evils of the town. But my brother lives in South Queensbury, and I've got to say it's a very, very sinful place. Shocking, truly. So if we think we've managed to get rid of our sin from the previous year, then we can look forward to the next year and divining the future. And there's a host of different ways to do that. So I'll touch on just a few. These are three little uh, familiar plants that were used in love divinations, and we've seen a few already. But Bellus perennis is that classic one where you can take off the outer ray petals, and as you pull them off, you can see that classic thing of they love me, they love me, don't, they love me, they love me, don't, or they love me, they love me not. Uh, and it's great because you can just be quite strategic and guaranteed to end up with they love me at the end in every case. So you can work out if, if someone will love you or not. Um, apples, you can take the pip and apparently put that, and squeeze it between your thumb and forefinger, and the direction the pip flies out in shows you the direction of your your future husband or wife to be. Um, and last of all, Achillea millifolium, yarrow, a bit like our cabbages, will show you what your your lover to be will look like. So you can harvest some of the leaves. You can uh, there's various ways you can process them supposedly, but tie them up in a hanky and tuck them under your pillow and you'll dream of what your future future husband or wife will be like. So there's lots of these lovely little kind of um, rural traditions that people had through um, even into kind of mid and later Victorian times that they would do. And yeah, it's a, it's a shame that many of them have, have died out. But if you want greater divination, then we'll look at our, our last couple of plants here. So you can go to the, the Pythia, the, the Oracle at Delphi and her um, braziers in the cave in which she, she uh, gave her pronouncement from would burn laurel and it has these slightly kind of hallucinogenic effects and probably combined with um, some uh, sort of uh, geothermal or sort of uh, geo uh, like sort of sulfurous vents essentially in the caves at Delphi um, and a bit of religious fervor then this priestess of Apollo was thought to be able to see the future and um, right throughout classical times, if you wanted to know whether to go to war or not, or, or what the best kind of course of action would be for your country, you would go to the, the Pythia, that oracle at Delphi, and she would drink deep of laurel leaves and use that to be able to see the future, supposedly. Of course, she would give nice kind of a uh, sort of cryptic prophecies, so you weren't always guaranteed to interpret it correctly. But this one here, with oak apples is our last one and it's a way of kind of working out what will happen in the coming year ahead and I think it's it's quite nice to see this one so you could open up an oak apple and these are very shriveled ones here and look inside of the little kind of gall wasp that's in there and if the wasp was mature um, it was thought to be a fly and that would signify war was coming if there was a spider in there it would signify pestilence was coming but this one here that I opened up I'm reassured to see um, has got a, what was thought to be a maggot, which is actually the larva of the gall wasp in it. And that was thought to signify famine. And I tell you, after the amount I'm going to eat at Christmas time, I definitely need a bit of famine to get back into shape. So folks, thank you very much indeed.
and have a truly wonderful festive season. Well, oh, yeah. thank you. Happy for any questions? Yeah, thank you, Greg. It's very interesting. I seem to have lost myself at this point. Wait a minute. There I am. OK. Um, <clears throat> now we've got about 50 people here this evening, mm -hmm. but they're being very quiet and they aren't asking questions. So come on, come on, people. Start typing, please. But while they're thinking about it, and I think you've given us an awful lot to think about and told me about a lot of traditions I've never heard about. But, you know, you mentioned many of these traditions are really ancient in origin. Uh, and you mentioned that, for instance, you know, some of the traditions are maybe dying out, like love mm. me, lovely not and all the rest of it. But do you think new traditions are developing or do you think we just moved away from that way of thinking? Well, it's quite intriguing to see. I, I kind of, uh, uh, on a personal level, um, I might be a bit prone to it, but I'm probably admitting too much here. But for example, if I make pancakes, um, I always, always make a big pancake at the end of the batch and set it aside. And you're not allowed to eat it tomorrow because that's the king of the pancakes. And if you eat it on the same day that it's made, then it's really bad luck. And that's just made up out of utterly nowhere for my kids to have a kind of stop them eating too many pancakes from one batch. But I can't help thinking that probably everybody, I hope everybody has their own little kind of quirky little individual personal things like that. And at, at primary school, I suspect everybody has their own little traditions that they build up with their little groups of friends. And you can see quite a lot of them come through into kind of uh, sort of local folklore and they'll die out but it's kind of it is a kind of a constantly moving field it's quite intriguing yes um i remember at um primary school you know having to jump over the cracks in the pavement and all that sort of thing because otherwise something horrible would happen to you and of course you you'd associate having jumped over the cracks in the pavement and missed standing on any of them in, then with a class that went better than you had expected or a test you had yeah. to do that you know you didn't fail too miserably at or something like exactly. that and so I suppose that's in many ways how these things um, sort of you know develop over time. Um, I, I guess that there might be that little element of um, as more kind of rational scientific kind of explanations for things come in then it is much much more difficult for some of these stories to kind of pop up because we you know we, we can understand why plants smell like they do or we can understand why they have a uh, sort of a red coloration in them it's not blood and it's not some curse but it, it's it's some uh, kind of anthocyanins or something like that kind of thing. So yeah, so those aspects will be dying out. And it is important for us to record them and preserve them as well as we can. But there's always huge big plot holes in our understanding, and that actually gives us some, I think, some really interesting uh, elements we can interpret for ourselves as well. I wonder whether uh, with the internet and everything else, you know, we're now getting lots of alternative facts and. Mm. and things which we will look back on and say people believed I certain know. things and is, is this a development of new myths I don't know mm. <laughs> I have to look back <laughs> I know I know what you mean because probably everybody does have that need for a little bit of something you know these these stories are quite intriguing it's great yeah okay Max Coleman has is asking here is Russell Ashwood about, no, that's over on the west coast of Scotland, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, a term derived from the Norse, Norse tree of life. Oh, I'm not sure actually. That's quite intriguing to hear actually. Um, where, whereabouts is it? Is it somewhere that would have ever been in the um, kind of kingdom, the Norse kingdom? I think the kingdom of the Isles? So through to the 1400s essentially. Um, but that that was more islands and because I don't know exactly where it is, I'm afraid. 
Um, I'm struggling to think of the name of the place at this moment. It'll come to me in a minute, probably when this question's gone. <laughs> um, it's it's Apple. It's near Apple Cross oh, Peninsula. Yeah. That's right. Well, yes. Yeah. So that is kind of far enough <laughs> north that that would be an intriguing one to have a look at. But I'm not. I'm not very good for etymology things at all. So um, definitely one to have a look at. I think. But that's far north enough to have that right. um, kind oh. of Norse influence. Definitely. There's some new questions coming in now. Um, OK, I heard that particular trees had particular meanings when used to provide the Yule log. Do you know anything about that? I, I don't, I'm afraid for that, aside from just that same kind of awareness for things. Um, but I guess it's tied in to a degree with that same idea of the kind of the language of flowers as well, I suspect. Um, and might be a bit of kind of what divination and trying to kind of influence what your future would be like. So, <laughs> now, somebody says uh, we have juniper trees in Oregon, USA. Are they related to juniper communists? Ooh, the, might be a different be, one. Yeah, I mean, certainly they'll be close. I know communist does make it over into um, sort of North America, but I'm not quite sure if it would make it um, that far down. An intriguing one, but you could probably find out, I would think, quite readily um, just by looking at your local flora. Um, it's amazing, there are quite a lot of interesting, particularly these kind of upland plants and alpine plants that are shared right across the kind of boreal region. So it was amazing seeing um, this little plant here, you can maybe see, this is our logo here, Sibaldia procumbens, which is named after the founder of the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, uh, Robert Sibold. And I had a chance to see that exact same plant that we can see in our hills here um, over in really high altitude in Colorado as well. So a lot of shared alpine plants and juniper, would, juniper is communist, that species um, might fall into that group. Now we have a question from Maria. She says, I know you have a plastic tree, but has there been a change in the traditional Christmas tree species over the years? I remember Christmas trees that smelled. I know, I think that's <laughs> right. and. I think uh, probably there's been that compromise as it's shifted over to kind of lusher, blunter needled, some of the firs, I think, uh, with lusher, blunter needles that don't have quite that same smell to them. And um, what's the other bit? A lack of needle drop. So I think some of the kind of Nordman firs and things like that kind of thing are, are a bit better at holding on to needles. So it has certainly changed. And, and also there'll be that aesthetic thing, definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're right about. Um, sorry, I'm getting feedback here for some reason. Um, I I think you're right about the ones that dropped their needles used to smell. So you'd mm. end up with them in the carpet for the next six months afterwards, but they'd smelt gorgeous over Christmas. Exactly. And now you've got <laughs> a plastic tree and some uh, room spray. You know, some kind of <laughs> room spray it doesn't quite do the same, does it? No. No, I don't think so. Uh, oh, now Patricia McDonald's asking if there are any interesting traditions associated with Heather. It's quite an interesting one. There's, for In terms of overall sort of, if you like, the kind of mythology, magic side of things, it's not so much. It's quite a kind of prosaic, pragmatic seeming thing that pops up. Um, I suppose there's the bit with burning Heather to bring rain on um, is one and the kind of lucky white heather things as well for that kind of magical aspect. But it's a bit a bit of a kind of prosaic plant. Uh, so used in a whole host of different things for making ropes, for um, brewing into beer as a flavouring. Um, and, and it's one of these ones where it hasn't actually developed quite so many stories around it. Quite intriguing. Oh, and she also asks about heather honey. Is there anything <laughs> interesting there with uh, traditional or medicinal um, value? Not that I know so much overall, that, and that's, that would just be my ignorance on that, I think, for things. Um, but uh, there are quite intriguing uh, other honeys from other era cases. So the kind of classic thing that pops up is these rhododendron honeys that are sort of quite hallucinogenic and uh, appear not so much in myth, but in history um, as things that were set out um, in the Black Sea coast 
I think Xenophon, when his men were making their way back over from a disastrous campaign in Persia, a whole host of them uh, ate some of this uh, rhododendron honey by mistake and fell into a stupor, uh, but recovered and made their way back to, to Greece ultimately successfully. But yeah, some intriguing ones, but I've not heard that for heather honey at all. Well, if that happens with rhododendron honey, um, considering we've got these invasions of rhododendron, especially over on the mm. West Coast, mm -hmm. how does that affect beekeepers? Do you know? I don't actually. That would, that's quite an intriguing one. It's these gryanotoxins and they are, what are they predominant? They're either in luteus or um, ponticum. So uh, ponticum is definitely around, and both of those species are definitely around that Black Sea area. And I think it's more prevalent in one species than the other. Um, so yeah, I'm quite, I'm not sure actually. I, I, do we have any beekeeping experts around? Or? <laughs> Nobody's chipping in. I shall have to go away and think about that one and look yeah. it up, I think. <laughs> You've got me thinking now. Mm. OK, I can't see any more questions. Um, so thank you, Greg, very much for your talk. It's It's been very interesting. And while I'm eating my Christmas dinner, I've not yet decide what, decided what we're going to have, actually. So I may bear in mind some of your recommendations tonight. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, you can see on the screen the next events. And uh, thank you very much, Greg, and thank you to the audience for coming here tonight. And thank you very much for your patience at my rambles. It's much appreciated. <laughs> All the best. It's great. Thank you.